Okay. So we've been talking, apropos, about the prophetic, the true prophetic voice. We've been talking for a couple of weeks about the true prophetic voice. But today I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into the false prophetic voice. Jeremiah told the people of God, the servants of the Lord, that some of them prophesied by Baal. We're going to take a look. And whenever the enemy comes to us with something that is a deception, I want to establish a way and a means that we can be sure of what is the word of the Lord and what is a false word, a deception. And what I have found through my walk with the Lord is that prayerfully embracing a body of scripture on a particular topic prayerfully embracing a body of scripture will reveal the heart, the nature, the character of God as opposed to making a decision or forming a conclusion on one scripture here and there. Yes. When you want to know the mind and the will of God, you have to prayerfully examine a body of scripture on the topic that you're pursuing. And in fact, when you discover the heart, the character, and the nature of God, there is a way that the Holy Spirit descri describes that. What they say is that you know his Name In Psalm 91, the 14th verse, the Lord says, Because he loves me, I will deliver him. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. And that, that knows, because he knows, is that Hebrew word, Yada, and it means to know very well. As Adam knew his wife and she conceived is the same word, Yada, to know my name, to intimately know my name. And that word, Hashem, or Shem, means the reputation, the character, the manner of God. Have you ever had somebody tell you a story, an unflattering and accusatory story about someone that you know very well? And you go, that just doesn't sound like Mary. That just, I know Mary. That just doesn't sound like Mary. As we come to know the character and the nature of the Lord, we begin to sense what really is congruent with who God is and who isn't. We see that the name, the essence of God, having that intimate connection to who he is, is our best protection against deception. And that's what the Lord said in Psalm 91. He who knows my name, I will protect him because he knows who I am. He knows my character. The love of the truth is our guardian the love of the truth is our bulwark 
It's our, it's our wall of protection. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul said, The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. With every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. And with every, every, that's a big word, with every wicked deception. The coming of the lawless one, and it's the spirit of lawlessness paving the way for him right now. Amen. Yeah. And how is he going to step into power? The Bible says he will deceive many by peace. So the spirit of lawlessness is creating a path just the way John the Baptist created the path with the spirit and the baptism of repentance and holiness to usher in the ministry of Jesus. The spirit of lawlessness is creating the path to usher in the lawless one who is going to deceive by flattery and by peace. And it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this deception is directed against those who are perishing, why? And this is the bottom line. Because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. They refused the love of the truth. They made a conscious choice and rejected truth and we're going to find out why for this reason because they refused and that word mean it meant absolutely not do you have any people in your life that are absolutely not receptive to the things of God the truth of scripture absolutely not Will you come to church? Absolutely not. Do you want to pray? Absolutely not. They refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. And it says, for this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie in order that judgment will come upon all who have disbelieved the truth and have taken their pleasure in wickedness. Wow. The carrot is the pleasure of sin. And Paul tells us it is pleasurable for a season. But God says, because they took their pleasure and they delighted in wickedness, they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. And so they believed the lie. And in the spirit of the Antichrist, it, it tells us they're going to have every possible wicked deception, every power, every sign, and every false wonder. They're going to have a lot of fodder yes. to believe their lies. They're going to be well supported in their lies. 
So today, I wanted to look at what God defines as wickedness and how he responds to it. Why? So that we can identify wickedness and learn from him how to respond. And it seems like, well, shouldn't that be obvious? I would say in the age of deception, no. In the age of deception, it has become much less obvious. In Psalm 103, it says, He made known his ways to Moses. His, and that word, his conduct, his values, his practices, his manner. God made known his ways, his character, his precepts, his, his behavior to Moses. And he made known his deeds to the people of Israel. Understanding who he is and knowing his ways protects us. There is no one more proficient at knowing the word of God than Satan himself. He knows it better than we do. He can quote scripture better than we can. He's a brilliant and a cunning and a malicious being. And he quoted scripture to Jesus in the wilderness. He quoted scripture to Eve in the garden. We are not going to be protected from deception by being able to quote a couple of scripture. We are going to need more than that. We are going to need more. It's vanity to argue a scripture here, a scripture there. We need an intimate knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. We need a solid understanding of the body of scripture, sound doctrine, and the witness, the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Think about what Lucifer did to Jesus in the wilderness. He quoted scripture over and over. Knowing God's ways and his heart response. When we talked about idolatry last week, I wanted to sink my teeth into really revealing the heart that God has toward idolatry. Did I do a pretty decent job? Yeah. Do you, yes, yes, did you yes. feel like when you left here, not only did you never want to be idolatrous, but you didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole? You didn't want to even go anywhere near it because we understood from what we saw last week that idolatry was not just blatant worship. It was a leaning in. It was a movement toward. It was an affection for the enemies of God. And I know we all think that we are above this. But I want to show you some things in our culture that are really big traps for us. The nations and the cultures all around the world embrace a centerpiece of idolatry. And in fact, our country does the same. We have cultures that are established around a centerpiece of a false god. Ancient Israel, the pagan religions of antiquity, and the early church all understood something that has somehow escaped the modern church. 
And some Bible scholars call it cosmic geography, and some call it territorial spirits. I want to read something from the Word of God that I thought really hit the nail on the head, made it really plain what this issue is. I'm going to read from 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. And this is right before the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. It says, In the ninth year of Hosea, he was the last king of Israel before they were conquered. The king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala, the harbor, the river of Gozan, and the city of the Medes. And the scripture says, and this occurred, so in other words, they were carried away from their homes. They were taken into exile. They were overcome and overpowered by an enemy force, an enemy nation. And it says, and this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. They had feared other gods. And that word feared, it means they were drawn to. They admired. They stood in awe of. And they honored, they held in high esteem. Well, I don't fear other gods. I don't worship idols. So what was it that they were doing that God said they were leaning in? And do you remember last week how I, I tried to demonstrate from the word of God how personal this was to the Lord? Yes. This idolatry, this spiritual prostitution, he called it, how personal it was to him? So it says they walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out and in the customs that the kings of Israel practiced. And the people of Israel secretly did things against the Lord that were not right. They didn't honor his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers. And they neglected the warnings that he gave them. They were drawn to false idols, and, they, and that word means frauds. Worthless frauds is what the original language means. They were drawn after useless, worthless frauds, and they became worthless and useless. That's what it says. They became... Whatever we're drawn to and whatever we gaze upon transforms us. We are transformed by what we behold. That's why Jesus, the scripture says, when we see him, we will be like him as we behold him in his glory. It works to our detriment as well. It says they abandoned the commandments of the Lord and they made images of two calves, symbol of Baal. They made an Asherah, female goddess, and they worshipped the host of heaven. They read their astrology in the weekly newspaper. I'm kidding. Okay. They were drawn to the host of heaven. They worshipped the host of heaven. They were drawn to the female goddess Asherah. And they burned their sons and daughters after they were promiscuous and they aborted their children. And they used divination and omens. And they sold themselves to do evil and provoked the Lord to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry and he removed them out of his sight. This is what I think is so fascinating. We read this how many times over through the word of God, right? 
how many times over? And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, which was a cult center, the god Nergal, who was the god of war, and Ava, Hamath, and all these other gods, Sepharvaim, the city of the sun god. And he brought people, and he placed them, his Assyrian people, and other cultures, he placed them in Samaria, in Israel. So he took the Israelites out of their homeland, and he put foreigners, the Assyrians, on Israel ground. Instead, is what it says, instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria, and they lived in its cities. And in the beginning, they did not fear the Lord. Well, of course not, they were pagan. They were worshiping demon gods. Here's what it says. The Lord sent lions among them and killed them. The Lord, Yahweh, sent lions among them and killed them. So the king of Assyria was told, the nation that you carried away and you've placed in the cities of Samaria, they do not know the law of the God of that land. Therefore, the God of that land, Israel, sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them because they do not know the law of the God of that land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, send there one of the priests whom you carried away, so get one of the Israeli priests, let them go back and dwell there, and let them teach them the law of the God of that land. They understood in pagan times that the soil and the nation had a spirit guardian, a territorial spirit that was responsible for that ground. And it says, so one of the priests whom they had previously carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Why is it that I've spent most of my life in church from the time I was 17 years old and nobody ever told me this is the way this works? Now it's obvious enough when you Google and you look at the gods of India, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Islam, the gods of Saudi Arabia, the gods, it's easy enough, and you will see all the gods listed for all of these nations. But we were never taught this, and it is all throughout the word of God. So the priest of Israel taught these Assyrians how to fear the Lord. So they put Yahweh into their pantheon of gods. Were they blessed? No. They included him. And they served offerings and sacrifices to the Lord as they did to all of their other gods. Well, it didn't do the trick. But I wanted to show you how obvious this is to the nations of antiquity and to the early church. Okay, this is all throughout the Word of God. So here's the point. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, the Lord says to Moses, 
Here are the statutes and the rules that you must be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. The Lord says, you must surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars. You shall dash in pieces their pillars. And you shall burn their ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods. And here's the reason why. You shall destroy their name from that place. In the book of Revelation, it says that the Lord releases a plague, but before the angel is permitted to release the plague, he said, put the mark, put my name on the forehead of every one of the people of God. Mark them with my name that they will not be hurt by the plague. And God wanted the Israelites to remove the name of these fallen angelic beings, what scripture also refers to as demon gods, from the, the land that God was consecrating. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes for him to put his name and make his habitation there. God was not willing to share consecrated ground with any demonic spirit or any other God. Do you remember last week when I read from Ezekiel and the word of the Lord came through Ezekiel and Ezekiel told them, thus saith the Lord, you either tear down these altars and these high places and utterly destroy them or I will destroy them and I will pile your dead bodies on top of their high places. Do you remember when I read that last week? God was not willing to share. Okay, so let's continue on. When you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest, from all your enemies so that you live in safety, then to that place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, then there shall you bring all that I command you. Well, can I worship God wherever, whenever, however I want to worship him? Isn't the Bible says the heavens and the earth are full of the glory of God. He owns it all. Yet God has chosen through a body of scripture to set his name and command his people to assemble where he sets his name. That is the way he has always operated. And that is why Paul said, forsake not the assembly together. But we don't want to serve God the way he wants us to serve him. We want to serve him the way we want to serve him. Hit and miss. Maybe I'll come if I feel like it. 
Maybe I won't. This isn't about legalism, is it? You know what I'm saying? God reveals his heart and his purpose through a body of scripture. Are there dozens? No. There's hundreds, hundreds of scriptures that support. This is God's way. This is God's way. Okay. So the Lord says... You shall rejoice before the Lord, your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite that's within your town. Take care that you do not offer your offerings at any place that you see, but only the place that the Lord will choose. There you shall offer your offerings. And there you shall do all that I command you. So God was taking great care in instructing. And Jesus lived a life honoring this. Paul lived a life honoring this. Peter, James, and John. This did not come to an end when the Old Testament was concluded. All of the disciples of the early church, they lived a life honoring these principles in God. The Lord was cleansing the ground, and he was saying no sin, no idolatry, no false grounds on this ground that I have considered and I have marked with my name and I have consecrated. We know that when Moses came before the Lord, the Lord said, take off your shoes. I'm making the ground holy. This is holy ground for my presence. When Joshua, the Lord Jesus, appeared to Joshua as a warrior, and Joshua said, are you with us? Are you against us? And the Lord said, neither, but I am the captain of the Lord of hosts. And take off your shoes, because the place that you're standing is holy ground. God makes the ground holy unto himself. I want to talk something about idolatry. Thor. We all love to watch these superhero movies. Thor is the god of thunder. Diana, Wonder Woman. Diana is the god of Ephesus, who we talked about last week. Hercules. Hellboy is the son of Azazel, who we're going to talk about this morning. We have two generations of kids that have grown up idolizing superheroes who are demon gods. They are demon gods. Well, they're so interesting. They're so fascinating. Do you think we've leaned in to them? Do you think we've formed an affection or an attachment to these superheroes? These hybrids, do you think they're preparing us for what is about to come? The enemy is so cunning and so deceptive. There's idolatry all around us, and we don't think we're idolatrous. I've watched Wonder Woman. I've watched 300. The Titans, the Spartacus Titans, the Greek Titans, they were the Nephilim in the Word of God. They were the Nephilim. We're drawn to this. We have little kids. They have every toy, every Thor statue. We need our eyes open to realize what is surrounding us and what is happening here. The Lord said that when he came into the camp, 
that he was making the ground holy. He said I, in Exodus 23, I'm sending my angel before you to protect you to the place that I've prepared. Listen to his voice. Play, pay close attention to him. Do not defy him, for he will not forgive rebellion. Since my name is in him. The angel was Yahweh. The Lord revealed himself through the angel by day, the cloud by day, the pillar by night. He led them through the desert wilderness. But he said, my name, my character, my essence what is worthy of worship is in him. Be careful to listen to his voice and do everything I say. And I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. And when they didn't, because they drew near and the demand for consecration was greater, the judgment was greater. So 3,000 people died at Mount Sinai over the golden calf experience. 24,000 people died from the idolatrous worship of Baal. 24,000. And millions of Jews were sent into exile because the consecration is is greater as the Lord draws near. The consecration is greater. Ezekiel said, you build a mound and you made a lofty shrine in every public square at every street corner. He said, shocking, you spread your legs with increasing promiscuity. This is how God perceives this. You built a shrine in every public square. And after, the Lord sent prophet after prophet, and they ignored the words of warning. Ezekiel had another vision. They believed that the presence of God, even though Jeremiah and Ezekiel were prophesying for them to forsake the uncleanness of engaging with these foreign gods. They did not believe, the people of God did not believe the Lord would ever vacate. They never believed he would remove his presence. Jeremiah 7 uh, verse 4 says, they would respond, this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. They never imagined that God would vacate and desecrate the holy place. And Ezekiel saw a vision. And the presence of God and the cherubim and the chariot of God vacated the temple. And after it vacated the temple, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple over idolatry because the enemy was so cunning to package this idolatrous worship in a way that was so appealing, so appealing, and so culturally and socially acceptable. They wanted to be ecumenical. They wanted to be in good standing with the rest of the community. They wanted to be in unity. They wanted to be one. They wanted to be respectful. What God told them to do was radical. He told them to smash and to destroy. Now can you imagine if we went down the block to the Buddhist temple 
or the seek, and we started smashing and burning with fire. Can you imagine? This is what the Lord commanded them to do, and they would not do it. So 70 long years, they are in exile, under the control of their enemies. And then Ezekiel has another vision. And he sees the glory of God returning. Now 70 years, they have, they're coming out of exile. They have Cyrus, the king. He says, go ahead, rebuild the temple. Very small percentage of them. But they're moving back to Jerusalem. And they're rebuilding their temple. And Ezekiel has this vision. And Ezekiel sees the same way the Lord left through the eastern gate is now the same way that the glory of God is returning to the temple. The same way that Jesus is going to break the eastern sky and come back to Jerusalem, put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And they see this. So God, after 70 long years, is restoring. But here's the crux of my message. It's not enough. There's something else that needs to be done. And the Lord raises up a young prophet named Zechariah, a young man who experiences a series of visions and one of them is what I'm going to share today. The angel of the Lord came to him, came forward, and said, Lift your eyes and see that which is going out. So we see there's a return of the Lord and the glory and the presence of God. And then there's an expelling of something. He sees a woman in a basket. And I said to the Lord, what is it? And the Lord said, this is a basket that is going out. And he said, this is the iniquity from all the land. And behold, the lead cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women came forward and wind was in their wings. And they had wings like wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. And then I said to the angel who talked to me, Where are they taking the basket? And he said to me, To the land of Shinar. They are going to build a house for it. And when the house is prepared, they will set the basket down on its base. So this basket, which is called an epa, is a measuring basket. It is a basket that they use for worship. They fill it with grain. They fill it with flour, and they use it to measure. What do you think they're measuring right now? Iniquity. Measuring iniquity. Do you remember a while back I did a teaching on tipping yes. the cup? Yes. Tipping the cup of iniquity. How difficult it is for us to understand when someone does so many things wrong and they seem to get away with murder over and over and over and over again. And then one day, they do almost nothing. 
like what happened with, um, boy, I can't remember his name right now, the black sports figure who killed his wife and boyfriend many years ago, O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson got away with murder. And then one day, something very insignificant, and it tipped the cup of iniquity, and judgment came. Judgment came. So this basket, this measuring device, is measuring the, the amount of wickedness in this basket. A woman, a woman represents what? A woman represents the church, either apostate or virgin, either prostitute or bride. The woman represents the church. And they, the angel told Zechariah, this is wickedness, the apostate church in the basket, led represents dirt and dust, no life, not life given, decay, death. Where is the basket going? It's going to Shinar. Who knows what Shinar is? Shinar is another name for Babylon. What happened in Babylon? Babylon was the center of idol worship and rebellion against God. The Tower of Babel was built by the first world dictator, Antichrist, Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel, which was a ziggurat to the mountain gods. He was gaining access to the demon gods and he built the Tower of Babel. And many, there are many historians and much Jewish literature that say that he was Marduk in the flesh. Marduk was the king of the Babylonian gods. He is always pictured with a dragon. We know from Revelation 12. Dragon is the symbol of Satan. He has many names, Marduk, Baal. And this man was inhabited by a spirit of Marduk, according to what Jewish literature and many historians report that this was widely, widely believed. So we see this basket is being taken away. What I want to draw your attention to is how God is responding to wickedness and idolatry. He's sending it away. There's no place for it in his land. There's no place for it on holy ground. He's putting a great distance between himself and his people between them and wickedness. He's putting a great distance. I want to touch on something that's really misunderstood from Leviticus chapter 16. And again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to share the heart of God and the mind of God as it relates to anything that is idolatrous, anything that is wicked and sinful and contrary to his law. I want to read Leviticus 16, verse number 6. This is what the Lord instructed Moses to have Aaron do. Aaron shall offer a bull as a sin offering. This is on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. Aaron is the high priest. He does this once a year, every year. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and his house. Then he shall take two goats and set them before the Lord. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, 
one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord. And he will use it as a sin offering. Okay, that's easy to understand. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it so that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Verse 20. When Aaron has finished making atonement with the other goat for the most holy place, he shall bring forward the live goat, this is after he sacrifices the one to the Lord. He is to lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all of the wickedness and all of the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. I want you to notice the principle and the power of impartation. The principle and the power of impartation. And how one should be really, really careful about who you let lay their hands upon your head. There's a power. There is an anointing and a power that the high priest had to impute the sin of a nation onto an animal. God took this very seriously. It says, he will put the sins on the goat's head and then he will send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed to the task. The goat will carry on itself all of the people's sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. So is God now sacrificing to another spirit being? What is this about? And here is a great principle in God that we need to understand and we need to live by. I'm going to read to you from the first book of Enoch. Chapter 2. Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, and shields, and breastplates. Azazel made known to them the metals, the alloys of the earth, and the art of working with them, bracelets and ornaments, and the use of antimony, which is chemical elements compositions to make both drugs and they even use this chemical element to make bullets and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all tinctures which is like cannabis is a tincture and there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication well, gee, I guess so. They were drunk, high, stoned out of their mind. They committed fornication, and they were led astray, and they became corrupt in all of their ways. Who is Azazel? He is the lead, the leader of the fallen angels that Genesis chapter 6 details that took women had sex with them and created the Nephilim. It says God saw the sin that was brought about by Azazel and God had his holy angel Raphael bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and he made an opening in the desert which is in Dudael and cast him in the opening. And he placed upon him rough and jagged rocks and covered him with darkness and let him abide there forever and covered his face so that he could never 
see light. I read a story last year. I searched really hard to find this story. I wanted to bring it into you. Mind blowing. National Geographic wrote this story. I could not find it. A place outside of Jerusalem that people have gone in exploration, many people. And they come to a place in the desert where they hear, this has been documented, howling and grievous crying. Now there is nobody around for thousands of miles. And there is a place, they have named it the cavern of hell. They believe, they, the guy who wrote this article, believe it was an opening to Sheol. And anybody that went there hears the most horrific screams and cries of pain and torture. I couldn't, I could not find it. If you find it, please bring it in to me. So they write about this also in the book of Tobit, which is part of many Eastern Orthodox Bibles. They write about Azazel being bound hand and foot and being hidden in the desert rocks outside of East Jerusalem. And sure enough, in the book of Jude, in our Bible, it says the angels who did not stay within their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling, God has put in darkness, in eternal change for judgment on that great day. And he goes on to say, in like manner, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, who also indulged in sexual immorality and pursued strange flesh, so he's saying that these watchers, these angels, that's what they did. And Sodom and Gomorrah also pursued strange flesh, are on display as an example of those who sustain the punishment of eternal fire. In the 1950s, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found scrolls that told exactly the same story about Azazel, who was the leader of the angels that sinned and created human hybrids. So we have Enoch, we have the book of Tobit, we have other Bibles, even in the Catholic Bible this is included, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this Azazel is also a hybrid a demon hybrid, and Leviticus 17 actually states, they will no more sacrifice their sacrifices to the goat demons, which is what who he is, the goat demons who they whore after. The Lord is talking about his people. He's talking about his people sacrificing to these goat demons, Azazel. So Aaron would impute the sin of the people and send this goat to Azazel. Why? Because the principle in God is to send wickedness back to its source. To send wickedness to the place of origin. He's sending the sin and the depravity and the idolatry of the people back to the one who began the deception, but who taught the people how to engage in this kind of behavior. These elimination rites that God ordained to impute this sin and to drive the demons out of the human habitation back to the wilderness which was a place that was believed and is much much written about 
the demons in the desert wilderness. Azazel was the personification of impurity. And strangely enough, isn't that where Jesus went to meet and encounter Satan? So God has marked holy land and unholy land. And until the time of final judgment, when all of the earth will belong to him, and Satan and his angels will be cast into the lake of fire, there are boundaries that God keeps holy land and unholy land. So Zechariah, this young prophet, he sees the Lord sending the wickedness back to the place of origin where it all began. Back to Babylon. Babylon, which is a metaphor for evil and for chaos. Babylon one of the most dreaded images in the Bible and in the book of Revelation. And next week, Lord willing, next week, what we are going to look at is the mystery surrounding Babylon in the end of the age. The book of Revelation tells us about the dramatic role the powerful role that Mystery Babylon plays in the final days. That word mystery does not mean something that is not knowable, but it means something that can only be known through the revelation of God. Revelation 17, verse 5 Upon her forehead was written a name, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So that's, that's it for today. So we're going to take a look next week. Who and what is Mystery Babylon? And how is Mystery Babylon impacting the church of God right now? You heard me say prophesy by the spirit of Baal. We're going to see servants of God that are prophesying by the spirit of Baal as it relates to Mystery Babylon. Amen. Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord God. Father, we thank you for your word. Let it be rich in our hearts. Refresh our minds, Lord God. Let the seed of truth that you have planted from your holy word bring forth a great harvest. Let your blessed will be done. Prepare us, open our eyes, open our ears, and cause us, Lord God, to be discerning and wise in this end of the age. We ask this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you guys.